tonight. COVID cases on the rise again across the country. It's quite problematic. We're estimating about 20 to 30,000 new cases daily. A new vaccine is starting to roll out with urgency. We took our foot off the gas. Why this vaccine is different. An October heat wave in parts of Canada. I am okay with this. Sweat or weather can come later. It's really unusual. The impacts of unseasonably warm weather in the fall. And could Indian intelligence have really killed in Canada? He has nothing to lose. We break down the likelihood India's spy agency is behind violence here. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. The most up-to-date COVID vaccine designed to fight some of the latest strains of the ever-evolving virus is here in Canada, and the rollout is now underway. So right now, it's going to high-risk groups like seniors in some provinces. It should be available to most Canadians within weeks. The bad news? COVID numbers are sharply up now. Alison Northcott spoke with medical experts who say it is once again a race to get protected. Darlene McRae was eager to book an appointment for her next COVID shot. This is important. I, we have a vaccine against that variant. I want it as soon as possible. Fall vaccination campaigns are getting underway across the country. Quebec and Alberta have just begun their rollout of the latest Health Canada approved COVID vaccine targeting a newer variant in long-term care and seniors homes. And we can give uh, flu, COVID and pneumovax, pneumonia, pneumonia shots too. It comes amid a rise in COVID cases and concerns around waning immunity. In Quebec, uh, it's quite problematic. Uh, we're estimating about 20 to 30,000 new cases daily. Um, I actually was just on service last week and uh, we actually had four uh, severe uh, COVID cases. The new vaccine is particularly important for people who are vulnerable, says infectious disease specialist Dr. Don Vin. So people shouldn't rely on the fact that, well, I've got the older vaccines, I've got the original one, or I've got the bivalent one, and I don't really need a booster because it's not boosting what you've been previously immunized against. It's a, essentially a new vaccine. In Quebec, COVID cases and hospitalizations have been climbing since August, and other parts of the country have seen increases too, adding urgency to the rollout. I am really, really advocating that people get their vaccine doses as soon as they can and that provinces start making them available as soon as they can, particularly to the highest risk. We took our foot off the gas. We should have been a little more proactive in getting these vaccines out sooner. In Alberta, this home for people with dementia has been dealing with an outbreak. When we get into outbreak, we have to go right back into the masking and the goggles, doing all the PPEs. Some hospitals and health authorities are adjusting too, bringing back masking mandates they dropped just a few months ago. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. With us now, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, an infectious diseases specialist at Toronto General Hospital. So, Dr. Bogosh, this isn't just about COVID, right? There's a slew of other viruses out there, uh, flu, RSV. What do people need to know when they're planning these shots? Yeah, it's important to recognize that the vaccines for these uh, maladies are going to be rolling out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and and people should be mindful that, uh, you know, this the season is here and they should really be getting these vaccines, especially people at greatest risk for severe illness. It's OK to get your flu shot and your COVID shot at the same time. It might not be comfortable, but if it's more convenient for people, they certainly can do that. And new this year is the RSV vaccine. It's a license for people over the age of 60. Different provinces might have different protocols in terms of how they roll it out, but that's a nasty infection. And, uh, and it's, the vaccine appears to be able to reduce severe, infe severe infection. So that's, uh, that's another exciting development as well. People have a lot of questions though, right? So what about people who had COVID in the last few months, or, or maybe they thought it was the flu or a cold, but they're really not sure. Should they be waiting to get the shot? Yeah, in general, six months after the most recent infection or most recent vaccination is reasonable. Uh, but, you know, people who are at risk for more severe manifestations of COVID, that's not a hard and fast rule, and that can be shortened a little bit as well. But, of course, if anyone has any questions, it's best to speak with a health care provider to get individual guidance. All right. Dr. Bogosh, thank you, as always. My pleasure. The scientists who laid the groundwork for those COVID vaccines have won this year's Nobel Prize in Medicine. 
Thomas Daigle now with how their research helped change the world. Even after their decades of work helped to save millions of lives, for these two scientists, an early morning phone call from the Nobel Committee seemed too good to be true. And we said, you know, th th this has to be a prank. Some, some anti-vaxxer is, 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 you know, playing with us. It was no joke. Long before COVID-19 prompted urgent demand for messenger RNA vaccines, Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman knew the technology showed promise. Their breakthrough earned them prizes before, but none as prestigious as this one. So this year's Nobel Prize recognizes their basic science discovery that fundamentally changed our understanding of how mRNA interacts with the immune system. A Hungarian-born biochemist raised in a home with no running water, Carrico started researching RNA in the 80s, but struggled to find funding or even much interest, until a chance meeting at a university photocopier in 97 led her to Wiseman. I brag about uh, that I can do RNA, and Drew was interested in vaccines, and that's how our collaboration started. We spent the rest of, I don't know, 20 plus years working together, figuring out how to get it to work. Those mRNA COVID shots give the immune system genetic code, teaching it how to destroy a virus. Carrico and Weissman discovered how to get that code through immune defenses. You know, you can't have a better example of how something became useful for the whole world. The Nobel Committee credits the breakthrough for blunting the pandemic, and experts suspect the feat can be repeated to fight allergies or even cancer. I hope that these technologies and the recognition by the Nobel Committee of these technologies is going to, for the public, make it apparent how incredible these technologies are. They made a molecular-sized discovery with a massive impact, poised to save lives for generations. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. And the World Health Organization has approved a new malaria vaccine. It was developed in Britain and costs about half the price of the only other existing malaria shot. The WHO says it's also easier to manufacture. The vaccine is expected to be available on the continent of Africa in mid-2024. Back here, Manitobans are about to choose their next government, and, and it could be a photo finish after a divisive and at times negative campaign. Cam McIntosh shows us what's at stake when people head to the polls tomorrow. Fighting for her political life, Manitoba PC leader Heather Stephenson releasing a costed platform on the campaign's final day. This document reflects what we have been hearing from Manitobans. We're very proud of that. She's been low profile, taking questions for the first time in a week defending a campaign that's gone negative. And we say to every Manitoban out there, this is your time. You decide who is best to serve Manitobans. Yeah. Yeah. Stephenson is running on promises of tax cuts, tough on crime initiatives, and a vow to fight the federal carbon tax. As NDP leader Wab Canoe repeatedly hits at anger over changes made to health care. It's our belief that this is the number one issue in Manitoba that needs attention. Polls have the NDP ahead, but it could all hinge on a few Winnipeg seats. A minority government is a possibility. Conservatives are trying to shore up support with ads personally attacking NDP candidates. As Stephenson doubles down on a decision not to search a landfill for the remains of two murdered Indigenous women. Polls show Manitobans evenly split on the issue. It is a little bit of an odd campaign strategy on the part of the Conservatives. Because Political scientist Kelly Saunders says the landfill is a risky play. You're basically weaponizing and trying to politicize what is really a horrific, traumatic crime in this province. Meanwhile, the third place Liberals are hoping to be a spoiler. Their leader may struggle to hold his seat, but in a minority government, could hold the balance of power. Because it's within the power of your vote, which is an awesome power to deny either of these parties a majority. It's all exposed divisions in Manitoba on the economy, health care, crime and reconciliation. Manitoba's really at a crossroads on how we look at these issues and how we're prepared to deal with them. So Cam, clearly really close in Manitoba. What's your sense of how people are feeling about the leaders? 
Well, really, none of these leaders are particularly loved here in Manitoba. Heather Stephenson, since taking over as premier, has pulled around 23 percent and consistently comes in as one of the least popular premiers in Canada. But if she were to win, she'd be the first female party leader in Manitoba to win a general election. As for Wab Canoe, he pulls around 34 percent. Not great, but it might be enough to get him over the top. If he were to win, he would be the first First Nations Premier of a Canadian province. So with a race this close right now, Adrian, the parties are just focused on getting the vote out. All right, well, I'll be watching the CBC's Cam McIntosh in Winnipeg tonight. Donald Trump's civil fraud trial is now underway in New York, accused of inflating his net worth by billions to secure massive loans. The former president was not legally required to appear personally today. But he did, and he came out swinging. Chris Reyes was inside the courthouse. A brief glimpse inside the courtroom before the cameras were ushered out. Just long enough to capture the former president on trial. The attorney general leading the case, looking on. Outside the court, blistering words from both sides. My message is simple. No matter how powerful you are, no matter how much money you think you may have, no one is above the law, and it is my responsibility and my duty and my job to enforce it. This is a continuation of the single greatest witch hunt of all time. We have a rogue judge who rules that properties are worth a tiny fraction, one one hundred, a tiny fraction of what they actually are. Inside the courtroom, two different versions of the Trump empire. Attorney General Letitia James and her team alleged Trump and his associates, including his two adult sons, conspired to inflate the value of his prized properties by billions of dollars to secure loans, committing fraud in the process. While the defense portrayed Trump as a successful businessman who can demand top dollar for real estate. The banks got back their money. Again, there was never a default. There was never a problem. Everything was perfect. There was no crime. The crime is against me. The decision rests with one judge who already ruled against Trump last week on some of the fraud allegations. This trial is expected to play out for months, deciding the remainder of the charges and the damages. The AG is asking for $250 million. Trump is due to take the witness stand. At least for today, he had the last word. It's a terrible, terrible thing. This was for politics. Now. It has been very successful for them because they took me off the campaign trail because I've been sitting in a courthouse all day long instead of being in Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina. Chris, there was hostility even before the trial got going. You were inside that courtroom with the former president today. What was it like after they closed the doors? You know, the moment that really stood out to me, Adrian, when court broke for lunch, Trump walked right by the attorney general who was sitting in the front row gave her an intense glare, almost a disgusted look on his face. And then following him soon after, his son had an awkward handshake with her. It was a real glimpse into the tension between the parties. All right, Chris Reyes outside that courthouse in New York tonight. Thank you. Republican House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is fighting for his job tonight after hardline Republicans moved to push him out. I have enough Republicans where, at this point next week, one of two things will happen. Kevin McCarthy won't be the Speaker of the House, or he'll be the Speaker of the House working at the pleasure of the Democrats. That's Representative Matt Gates, who earlier tonight brought a motion to oust McCarthy as Speaker. He is leading the charge, furious at McCarthy's last-minute spending deal with Democrats to avoid a government shutdown. And California's governor has named 44-year-old Democrat Democratic strategist LaFonza Butler to the U.S. Senate. She replaces Dianne Feinstein, who died last week at the age of 90. Butler will be the third black woman to serve in the Senate and the first LGBT person to represent California. Now, back in Canada, we are over a week into fall, but in southern and eastern Ontario, it's feeling a lot like summer. From Windsor to Toronto and all the way to Ottawa, the average temperature hit about 27 degrees. That's just short of any records in those three cities, but well above historical average highs for this day in October. Those range from 15.9 to 19 degrees. And Kate McKenna shows us how some are taking advantage of the warm start to October and how long it could last. It may be harvest season, but... 
These crops are usually long gone by now. We're still picking uh, strawberries and raspberries and peppers and tomatoes and all, all those kind of warm season crops that uh, usually don't make it this far. For some, a pleasant surprise that's particularly sweet. October 2nd and I got a bunch of strawberries, which is amazing at this time. So it's really a blessing and unusual, like for 100 years, it's the first time we have such weather in October. It's a federal holiday and this golf yeah. course was fully booked. But this group says wearing shorts in October is not par for the course. Yeah, great day to be out on the links with the buddies here. So can't complain for, especially for October, right? So it's almost like a second summer. So great to be out. And every year is a bit different, but you know, we'll take it when we get it. Uh, this is perfect golf weather. Uh, this summer, you know, had its ups and downs. So I think the golf, any golfer would just love to be out in this weather. From riding a jet ski in t-shirts in Windsor to sunbathing in Toronto to ice cream in Ottawa, people out and about weren't mad about the hot weather. I love it. Summer is always too short for me and this is an extension of summer. It's absolutely beautiful to be able to come and be by the water and the sun and people are out. It's great. I am okay with this. Sweater weather can come later on. I think every day should be like today, but I do love fall and winter. Parts of Ontario can expect potentially record-breaking temperatures for the next couple of days, but fans of fall can rest assured. Colder and shorter days are on the horizon. Temperatures are projected to dip into the single digits this weekend. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, the NFL may have found its perfect match with the pairing of Taylor Swift and star player Travis Kelsey. I think she's the biggest household name in the world at this point, and anything she touches, like, turns to gold, basically. Why Swifties are tuning in in record numbers. That's coming up. Plus, artifacts taken in colonial times finally returned home. I'm going to be very happy to go back home and visit wherever these items are going to be displayed. The fight over a stolen prince that continues to this day. And later, the pumpkin that took home the prize. It just kept growing and growing and growing. A BC farmer takes his giant crop on the road. We're back in two. Eleven people are now confirmed dead after a roof caved in at a church in Mexico. Sixty people were hurt, some very seriously. This happened during a baptism. Several children are among the victims. The collapse was captured on this security video. Officials are investigating the cause. A historic show of support in Ukraine today. EU foreign ministers met in Kiev, the first ever gathering outside their borders. Margaret Evans now with their message. More flowers for Ukraine's ever-growing number of war dead offered here by all the foreign ministers of the European Union, visiting Kyiv together for the first time. An important gesture of support, says Ukraine's foreign minister. For the first time ever, Foreign Affairs Council is going to sit down outside of its current borders, of the borders of the European Union, but within future borders of the European Union. That's a clear reference to Ukraine's expectation that it will eventually join the 27-nation bloc, an aspiration embraced by Germany's foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock. Ukraine's future lies in the European Union, she says, in our community of freedom, and it will soon stretch from Lisbon to Luhansk. But the gathering comes after a pro-Russia party in EU member Slovakia won the most votes in a weekend ballot. And after key U.S. funding for Ukraine was left out of a temporary budget deal just agreed in Washington in a bid to avert a government shutdown there. Russia picked up its oft-repeated claim that the West will get tired of supporting Ukraine. And this fatigue will lead to a fragmentation of the political establishment and a rise in infighting, said Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov. 
But EU ministers in Kyiv lined up to reject that. France's Catherine Colonna warning Russia not to count on their weariness. We will be here for a long time to come, she said. And in the coming months, the EU's foreign policy chief wants member states to agree on some 5 billion U.S. dollars worth of military aid for Ukraine in 2024. Our resolve to support the fight of freedom and independence of Ukraine is firm and will continue. It was, he said, an existential battle for Europe as well. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. The United Nations Security Council has voted to send a multinational force to Haiti in an effort to curb widespread violence. The plan involves a one-year mission led by Kenya, but the number of troops and the deployment date have not yet been announced. This comes as parts of Haiti are currently under the control of gangs and the national police force faces a critical officer shortage. Allegations of India's role in a killing on Canadian soil have led to a souring of relations and questions about who was really behind it. Does India stand to gain if, if this man is killed? Most certainly, yes. But does that mean that India has done it? Is India's foreign intelligence agency really behind an assassination here? Plus, are Canadian students getting enough to eat? We are alone in Canada, in the G7, and not having a national school food program. Why some say Canada needs to be doing much more. And coming up next, football's biggest new draw. She's here. Taylor is in the house. The swift effect hits the NFL and scores a touchdown. The national breaks down the story shaping our world. Next. Look at that. That's the great American gymnast Simone Biles making a bit of history at the World Championships in Belgium, her first global event since stepping away during the Tokyo Olympics. Biles is now the first woman to land that difficult and dangerous vault in international competition. It will be called the Biles II since she already has a vault named after her. Well, Taylor Swift has expanded her already massive sphere of influence again, and she's done it just by going to a couple of football games. Lindsay Duncombe now on how the NFL is cashing in on that so-called Swift effect. She's here. Taylor is in the house. Witness the unprecedented economic force that is global superstar Taylor Swift. We're here for Taylor. I'm an even bigger football fan now because of Taylor Swift. There's Taylor Swift and the VIPs who are here. All Swift had to do was show up at two of her maybe boyfriend Travis Kelsey's football games and cheer. Ratings go up, dollars pour in. For the touchdown! Sunday Night Football had its best audience since the Super Bowl. Analysis from the first game she attended shows new audiences, overwhelmingly women, 18 to 49. And as for the two-time Super Bowl winner Kelsey, he gained 300,000 new social media followers in an hour, and his jersey sales skyrocketed. We've had quite a few fans, you know, Swifties as you call them, come in looking to see if we have any like Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey stuff. Well, what I think you're seeing is Taylor Swift's influence just porting into a new area or a new category of entertainment. Economist Brett House himself scored tickets to Swift's Detroit concert with his super Swifty cousin. Welcome to the Eras Tour. A tour that generated an estimated $2 billion in ticket sales alone. I think the really interesting thing from an economics perspective is whether phenomena like the mashup of Taylor Swift and the NFL do cause people to dip a little further into their pockets to go out and spend on services and experiences in ways that continues to keep growth and that helps us skirt the recession people have been predicting for a long time, but that hasn't come. I think she's the biggest household name in the world at this point and anything she touches like turns to gold basically. Little wonder the NFL is supporting this romance, frequently panning to Swift, sharing videos on social media. Everyone loves a love story, especially a lucrative one.
Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. So this is the point in the show where we drill down deeper into the news shaping our world. As inflation hits school food programs hard, we look at an unfulfilled federal promise. But first, what are the chances India ordered a murder in Canada? This is the breakdown. Six in the UK stand with Canada against India. After the bombshell allegation that Indian agents killed Hardeep Singh Nijjar on Canadian soil. All of this is just circumstantial. India labeled him a terrorist, but we've seen no proof they ordered the hit. So could India really be behind this? Let's break down how its intelligence agency has changed in a way that changes the probabilities. What do you need to hear for you to, to believe that it's possible this happened in the, in the way it's been described? Having known how the, how the Indian agencies work, I believe it is virtually impossible to pin it on them. Why? Why? Because even when they conduct certain operations in India's neighborhood, trust me, they've never conducted an operation like this outside the neighborhood. To assassinate a Canadian here is just not their style and not the region they normally work in. That is the firm belief of the man who wrote the first academic work on India's International Intelligence Agency, the Research and Analysis Wing, or RAW, the entity effectively accused by Canada of murder. All of this is just circumstantial. We can This, this kind of a theory can be built easily. Does India stand to gain if, if this man is killed? Most certainly, yes. But does that mean that India has done it? I think we need to be looking at a very different kind of evidence for that. Why the disbelief? Well, partly that's history. Embarrassed by intelligence failures in the 60s war with China, Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi formed RAW in 1968. Largely to watch Pakistan and China infiltrate groups, disrupt plans, and protect India's interests. Then in 1993, 257 people were killed in bombings in Mumbai. The attackers hiding in Pakistan. The leaders of RAW were poised to go on the offensive, but word came down from Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao not to, to show restraint, that killing wasn't the way to go. And that's the crucial and slightly unusual thing to keep in mind about this external intelligence agency. It's only ever answered to one office, that of the Prime Minister. So there's no legislative oversight. And largely, Indian prime ministers have wanted the agency to keep a low profile, operate close to home. But ambitions of prime ministers change, and Narendra Modi is a hawk. If one starts looking at it analytically, I would also say that there is some evidence, broadly speaking, of a shift in India's approach to use of force in international politics. This is Yogesh Joshi from the National University of Singapore. He sees clear shifts that make it possible Nidra's killing, even as far afield as Canada, was a hit by Indian intelligence. He sees that there's now political license for it. Modi has increased funding for the agency. His national security advisor is a former spy. And at the UN, India's ambassador advocated for crushing what it sees as terrorism internationally. Moves popular at home. Over a period of time, there has been a greater public support for use of force against terrorists, or what India calls anti-national elements or terrorists, right? And this political support comes from the fact that it has been a target of terrorism and anti-state violence. In a ranking of 22 global leaders, Modi is already viewed as the most popular. Numbers that have even increased in the days since Canada's accusations. That matters for Modi. National elections are less than a year away. When you look at Modi's domestic politics, he has nothing to lose. In fact, unlike Trudeau, his domestic ratings received higher approval. He has no domestic base in the state of Punjab. But even within Punjab, the new, the recent to the, you know, Pew Research Survey basically shows that the Sikh community within Punjab doesn't really share the sentiments of Sikh separatists in the diaspora. So the question still hangs. Could this killing represent a new, stronger, more menacing approach from Indian intelligence? Evidence is unlikely to ever become public. 
National security just doesn't work like that. And for all the anger in India at Canada's words, it certainly seems like at home, the accusation doesn't hurt Modi at all. And we now know that a 35-year-old Sikh activist died in the UK this summer in hospital after a very short illness. Considering Canada's accusations, that activist's family is now asking for a formal inquiry into his death. There's more intrigue ahead as we break down an exclusive story of a stolen African prince. He was under the protection, in a way, of Captain Speedy, who could speak Amharic, knew the boy, he was a favorite of Queen Victoria, but he died tragically young and was buried at Windsor Castle. Last month, a lock of his hair was returned to Ethiopian officials, but they say that is not enough. Abi Kouthasen shows us how Ethiopia is ramping up pressure on Britain to return his remains. Treasures taken from Ethiopia about 155 years ago being returned at this handover ceremony in London. I'm going to be very happy to go back home and visit wherever these items are going to be displayed. Leonie Turner was among the guests. She traveled from New Zealand with something she felt should be given back. I just looked inside this one expecting it to be empty. But inside I found these two folded pieces of paper. I just prized them open a little bit and I saw the two locks of hair. Keepsakes at the time. One lock belonged to her great-great-uncle Captain Tristram Speedy, the other to the young crown prince of Abyssinia, now Ethiopia. And now it seems the time has come to return them. But Prince Alamayu's journey starts with a letter from his father, Emperor Tedros, to Queen Victoria seeking a political alliance. Insulted when a reply did not come, the emperor took several Europeans prisoner, including the British consul. London did then respond by deploying 13,000 soldiers to northern Ethiopia. The mountain fortress at uh, Magdala was pretty high up, and you see the imperial uh, residence and the compound atop the fortress in flames. When British victory came, the emperor had taken his own life. Thousands of cultural and sacred artifacts were taken to England. The seven-year-old prince was too. He was under the protection, in a way, of Captain Speedy, who could speak Amharic, knew the boy, had known the emperor. Queen Victoria was fascinated by the boy. As a ward of the government, it was decided he would receive a formal education. That's how he ended up at Cheltenham Boys' School, where he struggled. He hadn't quite hit the bottom of the class, but he was struggling at this stage. Some historians say he was quite sad in a foreign land and died of pneumonia just before his 19th birthday. Queen Victoria wrote of him then in her diary. He was so sensitive, thinking that people stared at him because of his color, that I fear he would never have been happy. Alamayu was laid to rest at St. George's Chapel on the grounds of Windsor Castle with a plaque that reads, I was a stranger and ye took me in. Another letter was sent from Ethiopia to England in 2007. It was from the Ethiopian president at the time to the late Queen Elizabeth II. The request repatriate Prince Alamayu's remains. Buckingham Palace said no. The palace said there was considerable practical difficulties around his removal. I mean, I under, as I understand it, the physical remains of the royals themselves, of the British royal family, ha have been moved in the past. There is a precedent for moving human uh, bodies. Dan Hicks is a professor at Oxford. He says returns and reparations are about respect and human dignity. They're about what happens next when something that is almost built to make imperial violence, all of the ideologies of, of colonialism, to make those things last. The wider conversation about what empire once took and can now give back is only growing. And Ethiopia isn't giving up on their prince. We would like uh, the remains to go back to his country and rest. But uh, that needs careful understanding of the situation and careful handling. So we have continued working with the UK government. The hope that Alamayu, whose name means I saw the world, may one day go home as he had wished and finally end his very long journey.
So one of the reasons the palace gave for denying the request is that they believe it would be nearly impossible to exhume the prince's remains without disturbing the other remains buried in the chapel. Ethiopian officials say they are not giving up. Coming up, the high cost of food is affecting almost everyone, including students. It's been really hard to provide with what the money that we get. The push for a national school food program. That's next. There's a renewed push to feed hungry school kids across Canada. We need to be doing things differently. Every other G7 country has a national plan, but here, private donors fill the gap. I'm not sure we can sustain it forever. And food costs more than ever before. So Deanna Sunak Johnson is here to break down what gets served in different parts of the country and how the federal government could keep a big promise. At this Catholic elementary school in Toronto, each child gets a morning snack. What's your favorite snack here? Yogurt. What are the great dates? But the adults in charge of the snack program are getting nervous. Those eye-watering prices you're seeing at your grocery store, they're facing them here too. Their limited funds just won't buy as many little yogurts or pieces of fresh fruit as they once did. It's been really hard to provide with what the money that we get for the whole school year. People like Janet Polo are having to make some tough choices. Expensive fruit rarely shows up on the menu anymore. I brought them uh, pears. Kids didn't know what's the pears, so they were so excited, so pear gone. And while they try to give a kid a snack any time they say they're hungry, not just at morning time, a tight budget means shelves on the fridge here are a little emptier. It's heartbreaking when sometimes the kids come in and they say, Miss Polo, I'm hungry. Like, I don't have a snack for the whole day. The program here is run by the Angel Foundation, a charitable arm of the Toronto Catholic District School Board that serves some 90,000 students. Its funding comes from a patchwork of sources, some from the city of Toronto, some from the province, and the rest through private donations or fundraising. We're making up a difference. That's a huge responsibility. I'm not sure we can sustain it forever. As unstable as that funding is, schools covered by this foundation are some of the lucky ones. PEI is the only province that has a universal school meal program where families pay what they can for a hot lunch. Yukon and Northwest Territories also have programs that cover most students. But in many other places in Canada, kids don't get any snacks or meals at all. All this is happening as increasing food prices are making it difficult for many Canadian families to provide nutritious food for their kids to take to school. Making the question many have been asking for years even more urgent. Why does Canada still not have a nationally funded universal school food program? We are alone in Canada, in the G7 and in most of the OECD countries and not having a national school food program. We need to be doing things differently. Debbie Field is the coordinator of Canada-wide Coalition for Healthy School Food. We now have about a third of the kids in Canada funded by provinces and cities, some by parents, some by other donors. So we have something, but we need the federal government to make it consistent and grow it, because right now the affordability crisis is really important. You heard that right. Canada is the sole G7 country without a national school food program. So how did we get here? Researchers say it has to do with Canada's self-perception as a middle-class country where people can feed their children, something that these days isn't true for an increasing number of Canadians. Rachel Angler Stringer has been researching school food programs across the world. She says there was a big call out for such a program in Canada during the Second World War. But after the war, women were being persuaded out of the workforce and encouraged to stay home with kids again. And the federal government provided a little incentive. But in the aftermath of the Second World War, um, Canada implemented the Family Allowance Program, which was expensive. Um, you know, it, it, did, it did cost a fair bit. And the federal government made the argument that if we had a family allowance, there was no reason why, uh, why 
parents couldn't then feed their children. Eventually, that family allowance was replaced with income-based child tax benefit, but a school food program did not happen. Now, a tempting answer might be, wouldn't it be cheaper to just provide lunches and snacks for kids who need them? Experts say that stigmatizes families and isn't the best way to go about school meals. Here in Cowichan Valley in British Columbia, Nourish Cowichan organizations staffed mostly by volunteers serves more than 1,300 students in the region. Families sign up for meals with their school, but nobody will be turned away. Any child who wants uh, a snack or a lunch can access that through the school, whether they're on the list or not on the list. We really are focused on stigma and trying to make sure that there isn't any. Here too, they rely primarily on private donations but that money is getting more and more precarious. Federal funding would help them plan. I think stability is the word and predictable. We would know exactly the funding that's, that's coming in, at least the baseline of that funding, and could plan for that. People are telling us that it And advocates be say providing kids with free meals inhabitant. won't be the only benefit. Uh, Healthy, nutritious food means less obesity and diabetes in kids, and it will support parents too. I think this is a bit of an issue that really supports working women in the same way that childcare does, because it's probably working women listening to me now who are packing that lunch and worried about that lunch. So, how likely is Canada to get a national school food program anytime soon? The Liberal government made a promise to fund one back in 2021, an investment of $1 billion over five years. While there's been some disappointment that it hasn't appeared as an item on a federal budget since, advocates say they're hopeful. In a statement to CBC News, the newly appointed Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, Jenna Suds, wrote, Following extensive consultations, there was overwhelming support from participants for a national school food policy. It's important to eat your snacks so you can keep up with your work at school and so that you have a full stomach so you can be active. What do we have here? Uh, yogurt. Cheerios and oranges. Okay, give me that. As these kids will tell you, healthy food just tastes better when you're eating together. So, Dian, I'm thinking about something you said in your piece, which is that the feds promised, I guess, a billion dollars over mm -hmm. five years. If they went through with that promise, would that actually be enough? Well, the advocates we spoke to, Adrian, are saying it should be, because it's not as though these programs need to be created from scratch. Actually, provinces and cities already pour quite a bit of money into them. For example, BC recently rolled out $214 million over three years to fund the school food programs in that province. So the advocates say it is absolutely possible to provide a nutritious school meal for every single child in this country if the feds follow through with that promise. There's the if. All right, there Dennis you go. Dubinac Johnson, thank you. Thanks. Coming up, a Canadian pumpkin wins big money and prestige in a U.S. way off. Everybody laughs and smiles when they see something that big. So we'd like to introduce you to the pumpkin grower who took his giant gourd on tour in our moment. You are looking at Dave Chan from Richmond, B.C., kissing his giant pumpkin, as you do, which weighed in at 2,212 pounds. So he's been growing giant pumpkins for over 15 years, and finally this one, nicknamed Mama, landed him the North American title. Tonight, his gigantic accomplishment makes our moment. Let's hear it <laughs> for our winner at nine dollars a pound. So these things, in their peak growing times, put on give or take fifty pounds a day. So we got pretty excited about Mama right through the whole summer. It it just kept growing and growing and growing, knowing that this way off in Sacramento was the largest way off in the world, we decided that we'll take them down there and uh, compete. And so between the two, we put them on a flatbed trailer. It was 3,800 pounds of pumpkin going down the road. And we got many, many, many cheers and funny looks and you name it. Good. Here it comes up here. We zero the scale, we clean the scale. Everybody laughs and smiles when they see something that big. So that really makes a lot of people happy, including myself and my family and 
my wife. And we just have fun doing it. So what do you get for this? You heard him, $9 a pound, so nearly 20,000 US dollars for that. What do you do with the pumpkin after? Apparently you can sell the seeds, the rest go to farmers because pigs really like pumpkin. For all of us here at The National, thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app. Subscribe to The National's YouTube channel. I'm Adrian Arsenault. Take care.